go. All right. So um, let's keep going. After now that we've done this long analysis of a circuit, you're going to have to do this over and over and over again because that's how you deal with circuits, right? Basically using Kirchhoff's loop law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and then, you know, either Ohm's law or, you know, the capacitor version of Ohm's law or inductor version of Ohm's law. Or we're going to have like stuff like diodes, semiconductors. Those are those will have different behaviors, but all of them are have like a defined way for you to determine the voltage or the change in voltage when they pass through it. And they basically use the same techniques. You just do loops and loops and you junction and then you do your algebra. OK. OK. Um, but since this is a lab class, we're going to talk about all these devices that you guys are going to be using, uh, namely like a voltmeter and a current meter. So all of you guys should have one of these, right? This little yellow thing, yellow in front at least, right? So if you turn this to like V with a little bar on it, right? That's the DC voltage, meaning direct current voltage meter setting, okay? Um, there's also the little squiggly V down here for me, right? That's an AC current meter, okay? Uh, those, do, do you guys remember what RMS voltage is? Right? So in the in the wall jack here, the AC current, the AC voltage is 120 volts, but that's the RMS voltage. Remember that, right? And RMS voltage is related to the peak voltage by square root of 2, okay? So that means if you were to plot the voltage coming across these lines, right, the up and down, up here, this amplitude is not 120, it's actually about 170, right? The RMS value down here, that's about 120, okay? Um, and the reason for that, if you, you guys remember, is just so that we can use the same equations between DC and AC, and we don't have to switch between the two. And that's why when people are saying AC voltages, they actually mean the RMS voltage, not the peak value. OK? Um, but that's a little bit superfluous right now because we're not doing AC yet for um, next week's lab. OK? But what I do want to tell you is that basically, I might have talked about this in general physics too, how a, a, a voltage and a current meter actually work. OK? The way this works is actually based on magnetic fields and magnetic forces. <coughs> Okay, if you have some sort of current going through here, let's say following this arrow, right? Right, what happens is that this current will follow this little squiggly line and then come out this way. And it's going to go around and around and around, just a bunch of uh, electrons. Sorry, pos positrons going around and around and around, right? But in reality, it's actually electrons going backward. Okay, the reason that a meter like this will get deflected is because as this little coil is actually between two magnets, Okay, and what happens is that as current goes through here, this magnet is going to apply a force to this little wire loop that's attached to it. And then as it, it applies that force, it applies it in a way that creates a circular motion or known as a torque. And this torque will deflect this meter, right, this little needle uh, left and right. Even though these things don't have needles anymore, actually I should actually show you an old one that has these needles. Right, it still work on the same principle because um, it's basically a little coil, and there's a sensor here that basically tells you how far, how much did that little coil turn, right, inside these even digital meters. Okay, so this work on the principle of magnetic field. So let's do a little review on a current loop in a magnetic field, right, and what happens to it. Okay. So you have two, uh, a permanent magnet on both sides. So this is the north side of the magnet, south side of the magnet. Okay. So this creates a magnetic field from north to south, just like the planet, right? Right. And the reason we put it like this is because all, you know, between these two, two things, right? Basically, you have a constant magnetic field going straight to the right, which is nice. Okay. So it makes the calculation easy. Okay. And you, what you do is you insert a little wire loop in here, just like what we drew drew up top, instead of just, instead of like 10 of them, right, we just did one, just to make it simple, okay? So, what happened is that as current flow through 
this little device, it's going to apply a force on this side of the loop um, into the board and on this side of the loop out of the board. Okay, you can even figure it out by using the right hand rule. You guys remember the right hand rule? Okay, so the way I do it, right, is like I count one, two, three, right? So this is one, two, and three. Okay, so L is pointed up in this case because the current is going up, right? B is pointed this way, right, into to the right, and then so therefore the force is actually going into the board. Okay. Similarly, if I was able to get my hands all the way up there, right, right, what happened is that, oops, this way, right, since the wire is coming down on the other side, right, the magnetic field is still pointed this way, right, so the force is going to be pointing out to the, pointing out of the board. Okay. So you even figure out the direction, right. The cool thing about this is that this wire, no matter how this thing is spinning, right, is always perpendicular to the magnetic field. You guys see that? So the L vector is always going to be pointed up, right, and the magnetic field is pointed to the right, right. Even though this thing is spinning around, right, the L doesn't doesn't change direction. I mean, relative to the magnetic field is always 90 degrees, right? It's always perpendicular to each other. So therefore, right, that force is always just going to be ILB, right? whatever it is, okay? Whatever those variables are, okay? But since this thing's gonna just start spinning, right? We actually want, don't, don't need to calculate the force, we actually need to calculate the torque, okay? In order to calculate the torque, what I'm gonna do is I don't change view. I'm gonna put my eyeballs up here and stare down into it, okay? And that's what this view is down here, okay? Where now, right, the magnet, these two are the magnets, the wire's actually coming um, out of the board and coming back into the board like this, right? I'm just going to stare down at it, okay? And we expect the torque to kind of turn the force to be applied this way, so that's actually going to turn it like this, right? Okay. So if you um, do the calculation for torque, which is just R cross F, like that, okay? And now in this case, the cross product actually matters because, right, at this position, it has some angle theta, right? When the wire loop, let's do that in black, is in this position, right? Let's say across like this, right? Theta is changing, right? Right? It's small, and it gets bigger, and then it gets smaller, and, it's, and, and big again, small and big, and small and big, right? That relationship is actually going to just be the sine theta, right? Right? because it's a cross product, right? Oops, the cross product gives you how perpendicular two things are to each other, right? Right, and how two things are perpendicular to each other is the sine function, right? The sine of two things that are parallel to each other, meaning theta equals zero, that's zero, right? If they're perpendicular, then the sine of 90 degrees is one, right? Okay. R, right, is basically half the length of, half the width of this wire loop, right? Right, halfway between the two plates. Okay, and the force is just the force we're applying to, right? So that's that's what we calculate up here. Okay, the cool thing is that while well, you have the same thing on this side and that side, right? Both of the torque they turn the little loop in the same direction, right? So they actually add, right? So actually, this one half just kind of disappears. Oh, that's not right. Right, <laughs> that's W. Okay, both of these just add to W F. Uh, sine theta, right? The width of the loop times the force you apply to it times sine of theta, right? If you combine this torque and the torque and the uh, the, the force together, so where I replace the force with this, right? Basically, I just replace the force with that, okay? Right? You get um, basically W I L B times sine of theta, okay, it's just a bunch of complicated variables, okay? It simplifies because, right, if we draw this little wire loop, this is the width of the loop, this is the length of the loop, right, right? W times L is what? Sorry? It's the area of the thing, yeah, exactly. So, so I can actually replace W times L with that, right? So that's the amount of torque on this little wire if you have one loop. So, but notice up here, right, in general, 
right? It actually has, this. It, they just draw three loops, it generally is like 100 loops, okay? So it's actually multiplied by n times where n is the number of loops. So that's actually the amount of torque that the little needle will feel when you run a current of I across it, okay? So I'm showing you all of this, not because we're gonna you know, deal with this all the time, is that the thing to understand is that in any measurements you're making, in reality, you're actually measuring current. Because that's how you convert electrical signals into physical ones that you can physically measure, okay? Even if you are measuring, you're, if you're measuring current, right, which is these A signs all the way to the right here, Right, you're, more, you're measuring current, right? That makes sense. Okay, no, okay. But when you go over here and you measure voltage, you're actually, in reality, still measuring current. <laughs> it's just converting that current into voltage for you, okay? All of the device you have, right, even your cell phone, right, when it receives the signal from your cell phone carrier and it's measuring the signal, you are measuring current. You are measuring little electrons going around on the wire, okay? and converting that into magnetic forces that creates a torque that allows you to figure out how much, um, how many, how many, how much current is flowing through it, okay? So let's just talk about how your, your little multimeter actually measure current. So if you, um, inside here, right, I even have a picture here. The way you measure current, right, you all mean measuring current should be pretty simple actually, right? So if I have, right, if I just go back up to here, right, why is it all white? There it goes. Okay. Right? This little simple meter actually really measures current, right? So I can take that equation. Torque equals to N I A B sine theta, right? Okay. So now I have a, a uh, equation, right, that's equal to, I'm going to solve this for I, right? Torque over N times A times B sine theta, right? Depending on what the angle theta is, right, I can figure out the amount of current that's there, right? It's actually inversely proportional to sine theta, right? Okay. <coughs> right. In a real meter, what they do is they add this thing called a shunt resistor, okay? This shunt resistor is a way to divert the current so not all of the current goes through your, um, your amp meter, yeah? It doesn't go through the coil, the little coil, okay? So why do they do this, okay? If you go look on your meter, you can just physically look at it. I can point to it up here, and it's bigger. You're gonna see two different um, um, inlets for what's the, they just mark A, okay? A stands for ampere, which means it's, it's measuring amperes, okay? So there's one that's A, and there's one that's M, M A and then micro A, right? You guys see that on your meter, okay? These two ports has different shunt resistors on it, okay? All right, when you put it into the A, right, right, it'll give you the same coil, but the shunt resistor will be very small, okay? That means most of the current actually go through the small resistors, right? Remember smaller resistance mean a broader street, a bigger pipe, right? So most of the current goes through the shunt resistor and not through the coil, okay? But if you plug it into the, this side, mil, uh, milliamp and microamp, okay? It's gonna give you, let me just mark this, okay? Small. small RS, right? This one have a large RS. So that what that does is that it pipes most of the current through your coil, so therefore it deflects, so, so therefore it deflects the needle more when you have smaller amount of current going through it, okay? That makes sense? Okay, so, so this um, microamp port is more sensitive but it's also easier to break because if you put too much current through it, it ba you're basically gonna break that little spring that's holding it back, okay? So that's why down here, you can, yeah, th this picture doesn't show it very well, but if you look on your meter, right, there's gonna, it says 400 milliamp, 
fuse. Over here it says 10 uh, amp fuse, right? Is that what it says on yours? Yeah, 10 and 400, right? So there's a fuse attached to this, okay? And the idea for this fuse is to just kind of pop and just break the circuit. Whenever, if you put too much current through the more sensitive port, it will just pop that fuse, okay? If you took too much current through here, it will actually just break the meter, and then we just have, we just lost like you know 600 bucks, okay? So don't do that, okay? So when we're doing the current measurement next week, um, I think I have you just using the uh, the the big current port, meaning just the amp port. It's less sensitive, right? But right, it's less. Um, it doesn't have that fuse, so that 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 you'll pop, and then you, you're gonna have to like replace the fuse yourself, okay? Right, so that's how your amp meter works, right? Is by piping most of the current through this shunt resistor, right? And then and then measuring the magnetic force, the basically the torque created by the magnetic field from the from you running it through a little wire. Okay? So how do you think a voltmeter works? Anyone want to venture a guess? Can I run some current through something and then figure out what the voltage is? Okay. Let's look at the voltmeter. Okay. So this is the schematic drawing for a voltmeter. So instead of the shunt resistor being parallel to the coil, now it's just in series. Why would this work? Any idea? What? Like, is there uh, some guy's name's law that will allows you to relate voltages to current? Ohm's law, right? So, in this case, right, we're actually applying Ohm's law, right, where the voltage drop across a resistor, in this case RS, is proportional to the current, right? This is the current, so since we have only one loop here, Right, the current through this little uh, loop here called R coil is actually exactly what's going through the shunt resistance, right? So basically, if you can measure I coil, right, you just multiply that number by your shunt resistor, you get the voltage. Okay, so that's why I say when you measure voltage, you're not measuring voltage, you're measuring current still. Everything is based on current. Okay. Um, on your voltmeter, okay, so let's turn yours to um, DC uh, voltage mode. So it's just the V with the bar with the dashed line across it, okay? Um, most of the time, I think when you turn it on, it'll be on auto mode. Does everyone say see auto on the bottom there on theirs? Or on the top right? Where's, where's that? Because I have a different model, actually. Uh, top, top, left. top left? Yeah, it says auto, okay? So what that does is that it automatically switches the shunt resistor for you depending on how much voltage you apply to it, okay? If you want to measure something that's 120, it'll set the shunt resistor, I think the range is going to be 0 to 400, okay? So it's going to be less sensitive, so there's going to be a larger air bar on what you measure, maybe plus or minus 1 volt, right? But if you're measuring something that's 1 volt, it's going to put you in the range of 0 to 4 volts. And now it's sensitive to one millivolt, okay? So the lower the voltage you're measuring, the more sensitive it is, right? But then you can't measure anything that's 120, right? You can actually physically uh, force it to be a certain range. So if you push, there should be a range button on your meter, right? So if you keep pushing that button, it'll change the range for you. It should have a number that is kind of small. It'll, it'll change from four to 40 to 400. Okay, and 4,000, does it go 4,000? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so the maximum we can measure is 4,000, I guess. Actually, uh, it's rated to 1,000 volts, okay? So don't put anything above 1,000 volts, okay? okay? Okay, by changing that manually, right, you can actually force it to have a particular shunt resistor, so you, so you manually pick it, okay? But a lot of times, it's just, just leave it on auto, and then it'll automatically change the range for you, okay? 
But if you do want to force it to, be, uh, I need this to be more sensitive. Don't don't keep changing the range on me. You can actually force it to be a particular range. Okay. All right. Um, any questions about voltmeters and and amp meters so far? Okay. All right. So. Um, I think this section will be kind of quick, 1.5, which is simple equivalence. Um, so this is stuff you probably learned in general physics already, where if you have resistors in series, the equivalent is what of them? Just, I'm sorry? Just adding them together, right? If they're in parallel, how, how, how would you combine them together? Yeah, it's the, it's the not adding. <laughs> Just think about it as not adding, right? Um, it's called the reciprocal of the reciprocal, so so R equivalent, right? It's the reciprocal of the reciprocal, right? You just have to flip. You just have to do a double flip, okay? Okay. And therefore, you will get the equivalent version of it, okay? This is R1 plus R2, okay? So we don't have to go through that. Um, so you can, I think there's a couple of homework problems where you actually just have to prove it, so, you know, Maybe the first time you try it, don't look it up in your general physics textbook and just try it yourself, right? Just for a little test, okay? Um, for capacitor, everything is opposite. So the way I remember it is that I know that resistors in series, you just add. That means capacitor in series, you have to do the double flip, okay? So capacitors in series, you do the double flip, And then capacitor in parallel is the opposite version, so therefore it's just the add, right? Okay. Okay. Um, this was the example that I was gonna. This is when I was gonna do the example. Okay. So we got ahead. Okay. Any questions about those two concepts? So hopefully you'll get a little practice of it. If you can't do it the first time, you know, the your general physics textbook will, I think, a lot of time will derive one of them for you. All right, so the one the first thing we're gonna see is actually in lab one is gonna be the IV curve. That means we're gonna be plotting current versus voltage, okay? So when you say, when people say XY plot, that always ne never makes any sense to me because that means you're actually putting X here and Y here, <laughs> okay? It's actually a Y X plot, right? You're plotting the dependent variable as a function of the independent variable, right? So IV curves, Right, you're plotting current, and then the dependent variable, the independent variable is voltage. Okay, in this case, it's just a simple resistor. I don't even remember when I made this plot. Where, if you have current, if you're measuring current as a function of voltage that you can change on your little knob on your breadboard, for resistor, you're gonna see this linear trend. Where, right, if you apply two volts to something, you're gonna get 0.02 amp. And you can actually, by just look, by figuring out the inverse of the slope, okay, whatever the slope is, let's call that M, M1, right? This is actually one over M1. The reciprocal of that slope is actually the resistance that you just apply to it, okay? So therefore, the bigger the resistance, the lower that slope, right? Instead of one over 100, you get one over 200 as a slope, okay? Right? So, Let's see. I think I just kind of said what you notice about this plot. But what do you guys, What uh, anything else you guys notice about this plot? Besides the color? So this is something you're gonna do in the lab and analyze this plot for resistors and light bulbs. This li yes. And that's because of Ohm's law, right? So V equals IR, right? Therefore, if I solve this equation for voltage, what should I get? over R, right? So this is current as a function of voltage, right? And the slope we guess is one over R, right? Right, this is the dependent variable. This is the independent variable, right? right. That's why the slope is inversely proportional to the resistance, right? The bigger the resistance, the flatter it is, the smaller the resistance, the, 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 the more, what is that called? The steeper it is. Okay. So, okay. Right. So in general physics, we tell you that 
you can just pretend light bulbs are resistors. That's actually not true. <laughs> okay. So if you actually measure the IV plot for a light bulb, let's say you put a little light bulb in the circuit, right? And you measure the current while you monitor the voltage difference here. So this is like Vn here, right? Instead of getting a straight line, you actually start you get a curved line like this, okay? And you're gonna see this um, next week. Okay. So as you increase the the voltage, instead of the current going you know linearly with it, it actually peters out. Okay. The reason for this is that as you increase the amount of current going through that light bulb, it's gonna heat up the filament more and more and more, right? And one of the things that I kind of mentioned, and we don't have to go into details about that. As things get hotter and hotter, the resistance actually increases. Okay. Okay. All right. And if we're doing a condensed matter class, I can you know spend half an hour to to teach you guys what that why that the case. Okay. Um, basically, the idea is that you know, you know, the hotter something is, what happens to the atoms inside the material? It moves around faster. Okay. Therefore, if you are an electron. Right, trying to get through it by bouncing around, the more that those atoms are moving around, the harder it is for you to get through. Okay, so it increases the resistance as it gets hotter. Okay, but that's our that's my you know 30 second version of a half hour lecture in condensed matter. Okay. Okay, another thing that happens that you're gonna see start seeing this, uh, since we're gonna be dedicating an entire lab to this, is that you're gonna start seeing the load on the power supply. Okay, so these power supplies that you have, okay, it can supply you a constant voltage up to a certain amount of current that you're drawing out of it. Okay, okay. So um, in um, in general physics, I think the way they were it was taught is that you have a, some battery, right? And then inside here, what you want to imagine is that you have the battery that's idealized, right? But then you have the what is that called? The internal resistance. You guys remember that? Okay. Basically, it's the same situation with these power supply. It can you, if you draw infinite amount of current out of it, then basically your voltage drops to zero. Okay. So what happened is that as you as your voltage supply is being drawn out, okay, and you're loading this with some sort of device. It doesn't have to be a resistor. It could be anything. You're drawing more and more current. Okay. Basically, the supply voltage will start to, to fall, okay? Because it just cannot keep up with the amount of charge you're asking it to deliver, okay? Okay. So this is known as putting a load on the voltage source, and you're gonna see this, and it's actually gonna be useful, and we're gonna keep, this is what the next section we're gonna talk about is mostly about, okay? How do we deal with this load, okay? So this is where we're gonna do a little, uh, talk a little bit about this method called Thevenin's equivalent. Um, I'm gonna talk about Norton's e equivalents also, but we, we're not gonna use it. Um, so Thevenin's equivalent is useful when you have a constant voltage source, which is what we have in this lab, okay? That's why I don't do a lot of the Norton equivalent stuff because we don't really need a constant current source, okay? So one of the things is that, let's say I have this circuit here, right? We have one voltage source, right? We have power supply. I have a bunch of resistors arranged like this, okay? This is, you know, if you apply Kirchhoff's loop law and junction law to this, you know, after about an hour, you'll figure it out, right? <laughs> Maybe not an hour, like half an hour, right? Even though all the resistors are the same, it's just complicated, right? It's just a lot of steps of algebra, a lot of loops, a lot of equations to combine, okay? What we can do is actually combine this into a single circuit with just one power supply and some equivalent resistance, okay? Right, so unlike the parallel and the, and the series one, right? These are neither parallel nor series, right? So this gets complicated because of that, okay? What we can do is we're gonna find it, we're gonna, this Thevenin's equivalent method it's going to allow us to basically simplify this complicated circuit into this simple one. Okay? Right? I'm going to just tell you what the method is. Okay? To find a Thevenin equivalent voltage, see this uh, V Thev, it's not, th you know, right? Okay? 
we're going to compute what the voltage is it when this when there's no when this thing is on open circuit open circuit means a and b are not connected to each other you just leave it open okay okay because what's going to happen is that we're going to start putting a load on this rl okay and then and then we're going to see what happens all right okay and then to compute r thevenant what you do is you just do b thevenant divided by i short circuit short circuit is the opposite of open circuit it just means you take this wire and you just stick it together and then okay a lot of times it's not a good idea because you're just gonna uh, spark things but but we're doing this on paper right so that's okay okay all right so i think in previously i just did it in the board but let's just uh, do it on the tablet so that we can get this recorded also assuming i'm recording yeah anyway <laughs> okay, so the first step is to figure out V Thevenant, okay, and that's equal to V open circuit, open circuit. What that means is that I'm just going to try to figure out what V A B is, right, the voltage difference between A and B, that's it, All right, that's going to require a little bit of work, okay. Right. I'm going to redraw this circuit, okay, so that we have this. All right. Since this point is basically, you know, kind of looping around here, right? Um, what I can do, is, right, I'm going to draw it like this. Uh, let's not do the diagonal line. That's going to be confusing. Okay. Um, yeah, they're 90 parallel. Do it this way. Um, so you can see that these two are sort of parallel to each other, but except for this point that's connecting to it. Right. So what you can do, yeah, I think this is why the diagonal would make sense. Right, so basically these two are kind of are basically parallel to each other, but you just have to be careful how you parallelize parallelizing them. Okay. Okay. And then and then this just keeps going. Right, and once again here, you have another one that's kind of like this. So all I did is by basically instead of these um, vertical resistor, I just kind of make them diagonal instead. This is basically still the same thing, okay? Okay. Hmm. Does that help us? I swear I did this before. Oh, I did this on the board last stream. That's not a good idea. Okay. Uh, let's go back. So, so well, since this is open circuit, oh yeah, that, that gets simplified, right? If this is open, right, that means the current going through this resistor is zero, right? Because the current cannot go through at all, right? Therefore, this point here is also VA, right? Right, remember that the current drop across the resistor is equal to the current times the resistance, since there's no current, the current drop across that resistor is zero, so therefore the, the voltage on both sides should be the same. Okay, so this is still VA. Hmm. So we can, if we figure out what VA is, then we're good. Okay, so this is where I think we have to do a bunch of loops. Okay, I simplified it as much as I can. Okay, so let's do um, loop number, let's define the currents. Let's call this I1, I2, I3, okay, and then I4 is here, right? Here I5 is, you know, I can declare I5, but we know that's zero, right? Okay, so let's deal with loop number one, okay? Loop number one tells us that we're going to start here, get V0, we're going to get 
I one R, oops, minus I one R, come on minus. Okay, and we're staying on this loop here, and therefore it's I three R, and that's going to be zero. Okay. Okay. And then loop number two. So I so since there's four currents, I need at least four equation, right? Okay. Um, this is loop one, loop two. <coughs> loop two, right, if I start off here, I'm going opposite direction of the current, so I'm going to gain I3 times R amount of um, amount of voltage, okay? And I'm going with the current across um, I2, so I'm going to drop I2 amount. Two R. And it's nice that all of these resistors are the same, and that for it should simplify things a lot pretty quickly. Okay. All right. I four here. Right. It's going to be minus I four times R. And now I'm at the same point, so therefore that's equal to zero. So this R actually factors out. Right. So I three minus I two minus I four equal to zero. So therefore, right, this is whatever's inside the parentheses has to equal to zero. Okay? And is that already kind of known by Kirchhoff's loop law? Right? Because um, I1, oh, there's another thing I didn't notice. You actually, you don't have an I4. Anyone want to tell me what I4 is equal to? Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I2, right? Because we know that even though this split, we know that this ha side has to be zero, so nothing flows that way. So this is still I2. Nice. So I4 is actually I2. Okay. Okay. So therefore, right, I3 is just equal to twice the amount of I2. So that makes things a lot nicer, right? Okay. All right, we still have three variables with two equations, so we just need one more, so we can just use um, I, uh, Kirchhoff's junction law. I1 equals to I2 plus I3. Right, that's this junction here. Okay. We already know what I3 is. So I1... is 2i2, which is equal to 3 times i2, okay? So we have this equation with the i1s, we can get rid of that. We have this equation with i3, we can get rid of that. So I can put basically equation 1 all in terms of L, uh, i2, okay? So that's v0 uh, minus i1, i1 is 3 times i2, times R, right? And then I3 is twice I2, okay? Twice I2, three times I2, sorry, I miswrote here, so I copy that wrong. Um, that's R, that's equal to zero, okay? So V naught, um, so one, so this is five, t so when you add, when you subtract these, you get minus five, right? I'm going to move it to the other side so I get positive. That's going to be 5 times I2 times R. So I2 is actually going to be just V0 over 5R. Okay? So that's I2, which is exactly what we want, actually. Right? I2 is actually what's going to determine the voltage difference between A and B because Right between these two points, there's only one res this one resistor. If we multiply I two by R, then we get exactly what that voltage is. Right? Okay. So V A B is actually going to be I two times R, and we already know what I two is. So it's V naught over five times R divided by R, so the R actually goes away. So V A B is actually V naught over five, okay? And that's actually V Thevenin's 
which is the open circuit. Right? So that's one thing we got. Right? So we need to do the other part. <coughs> Let me get some space. Okay. So that's step one. Okay. And remember, right? So we got we got this done. Check. Right. Now we need to calculate what our thevenin is, and now we can just and that after that we can just plug that in there, and it's a, it's going to be the same circuit. Okay. It's going to it's not the same circuit. It'll behave exactly the same. We just simplified it a lot. Okay. So R thevenin is V thevenin divided by I short circuit. Okay, so so let me try to redraw this. Okay, R thevenin plus V thevenin divided by I short. Okay, what that means is that when you short circuit it, you just connect these together. Okay, so we're trying to calculate how much current flow through this path, right? I short. Right? How do how how we can figure that out? Okay. Okay. Because basically that's that's going to be basically I five, right? Previously I five was zero because we kept it open, but once we connect those together, current's going to f start flowing through here, right? Hmm. Okay. So let's figure that out. Uh, I'm going to redraw the circuit down here. Got one resistor, two resistor, three resistor, right? And then there's the ones that goes vertical, right? And then when we do the short circuit, oops, right? We connect it A and B together with a wire, right? Right? I cannot use the previous equation, the green equation, because I changed the circuit, right? So I can't use the same equation. R, 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 R. Okay. Now that these two are the same point, I'm gonna I'm able to redraw this a little bit. Okay. I'm gonna do it one step at a time because I don't remember how to do this either. Right. Because what happened is that, right? This third resistor here basically kind of just come back and connects to this resistors here, right? Right? Is that parallel? I'm trying to figure out. I think there is a simplification for this instead of doing the loops again. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the problem is that uh, I would look in the textbook. This is an example from the textbook, but the textbook was so short on describing this. Uh, yeah, let's see. Because um, the way you can kind of redraw this. Right, let's basically make this kind of. I just need to see it. This point. The problem is that the this end is also connected to. All of this bottom stuff is connected together, right? All right, let's just do it the brute force way. Blech. It's fine. Right. I short circuit. Let's see if I put this somewhere else. That's my notes from last year. I think that was basically the same. Yeah, I think I just did it on the board. I didn't take a picture of it. Don't look at the answer biz. I think I did it on a piece of paper. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's do it the brute force. So the brute force way is always going to be this loop stuff, right? And now in this case, we do have to deal with I four because, right? 
with this closed circuit, right, it is the same. Um, this current flowing through here now. Hmm. Should be an easier way to do this. I don't think the book does it easily. Let's see. Simple circuit program. Okay, so it does, yeah, there is a simplification, okay? The two rightmost resistors are equivalent. Okay, so, yeah, so these two, right, basically they're just kind of parallel to each other, right? Okay. So you can actually redraw this as this voltage source R, right, there's still this R here, right, combine these two together into, right, since they are parallel, they, they go as reciprocal, okay, so 1 over R plus 1 over R, inverted, right, that's actually R over 2. So that's what these two pieces are, okay, right, so let's replace that. Any rates? But I'm keeping all the other ones, right? Okay, so that's the same thing as R here, R here, R here. So those are the kept, those are the ones I kept. The ones I replace are these two. Okay. So the resistance for that is R over 2 instead, right? Because they're parallel to each other. Now, right, these two are in series with each other, right? So therefore, right, this is equivalent to, right, R times 3 halves, because 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves, right? And now, these two guys are parallel to each other. Okay. And if you do the little calculations, you're going to find that this is going to be the same thing as 3 halves the resistance. Okay. Sorry, 3 fifths the resistance. Okay. And now we have this combined together. <laughs> Right, finally, we combine the last thing together into just a single circuit, a single resistor, which is going to be, well, 1 plus that, so uh, 1 plus 3 halves, that's 8 halves. That's, sorry, 1 plus 3 fifths is 8 fifths times R. Okay. Okay. So all of that got equivalentized, okay? So then we use Ohm's law, right? So this is still V naught, okay? So V naught is going to be equal to 5 8 fifths R times the current. Is that right? That gives you I total. Right, because we just combine all of these uh, stuff together, okay? How do you get this eight here? Oh. Okay. All right. And what we want here is the been a little smarter beforehand, right? Because the current total is coming out here, right? But then you have a current that is split. Let's see what the book calls it. 
Uh, it doesn't even la label that. It gets split to kind of trying to follow the same notation as them. So the book calls this I A here. And then this I short circuit is actually what we want. Okay. Okay. And they found out that I A is going to be one fourth whatever B naught time over R is. Okay. So what happened is that when you combine I, that doesn't make sense. That's this line. Yeah, that's probably why I didn't follow the, the type stick. Okay. What's the equation here for I total? Okay, anyway, so from this, okay, I total, right, you can just calculate what this is, is V naught times five over, all, um, times 5 divided by A times R, okay? And then I short circuit, okay? Um, and I'll derive this a little bit later on, okay? Where it's gonna be just gonna be one fifth whatever the total amount of the current is, okay? I think the justification to that you can actually kind of intuitively figure out is that there are actually, right? One, two, three, four, five resistors, right? And we're trying to figure out the current going through the last resist one resistor, right? There sh it should be about one fifth the total current, okay? Because they're all kind of get equally distributed, because all the resistors are the same, okay? So, ISS in this case is just going to be this divided by five, right? So these five actually cancel out. So V naught divided by eight R, okay? So that's the short circuit. Sorry, the, the, the current of sur uh, short circuit. So R Thevenin is actually V Thevenin divided by I short circuit, right? And then V Thevenin is, you guys remember what that is? If I scroll up, V Thevenin is V naught over five, okay? V naught over five, and then ISS is V naught over Eight R. Okay, these two numbers cancel out. This is in the reciprocal of the reciprocal, so it actually goes in the new. Um, the denominator of the denominator goes in the numerator. So, so R thevenin is actually eight, uh, eight fifths R, and that's what we got. Yeah. Okay. All right. All of this, right, is so that you do this once, and now, right, instead of drawing that complicated circuit. Right? You will never have to draw the circuit again because what you can do is that you can say this is equivalent to V Thevenin, right? which is um, um, V naught over 5 times some with some R Thevenin in it, which is 8 times R over 5. Okay? And then you can connect this as if it's just the as if it had the five resistors on it, but you just have to do the computation with just one resistor on it, okay? So this is just a much fancier way, uh, much more, is for more complicated circuit that you can equivalentize, just like you did with the res uh, parallel and series resistors, okay? And this is really nice also, that this not only applies to resistors, but it can apply to capacitors, inductors, anything you can want to simplify, you can do that. Since I already spent a lot of time on that derivation, um, I think uh, I'm just going to leave the Norton equivalent to you guys to read about. Okay. Um, basically, this came that the book doesn't actually derive it, but um, this comes from um, this website. I just took all the pictures from allaboutcircuits.com. So this is a, actually a nice website you can look up yourself. So just actually homework assignment, go look that up. Okay, and just you know, navigate around that website. There's a lot of good information on there, okay? And it describes, you know, how you can do the same method if you have a power supply that is actually constant current as opposed to constant voltage, 
okay? Since we don't have a constant current power supply, we're not going to really use that use the Norton equivalent in this class, okay? All right. So that was a big example of um, Thevenin's equivalent, okay? So the book is going to force you to do that twice uh, in the homework, okay? So make sure um, you understand how to do that, okay? Okay. Just find the thev um, V Thevenin, right, and then go through all the little circuit analysis to figure out what I Thevenin is, okay? Uh, sorry, I short circuit, and I short circuit is how you get to R, R Thevenin, okay? Should I draw these steps out, or no? Right, right. Well, it's up here, and the book describes it, right? So, it's actually, right, you have to figure out what V Thevenin is, which is whatever the voltage is when you don't connect anything to it, right? And then you have to figure out what I short circuit is, is the opposite of that. You connect the two ends together and figure out how much current goes through that, right? And then you just divide that by V Thevenin and you get the the equivalent. And then and then the nice thing is that now you can just draw this circuit instead of this complicated one. Okay? It's a way to simplify things. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to finish up with voltage dividers, which is what you're going to be building next week also. Uh, voltage divider is one of the simplest circuits, and it's very useful because um, you, it allows you to um, divide voltage up into, into the smaller and smaller and smaller increments so that you can use it for to supply power to different things. Okay? So voltage divider is a very simple circuit. You have some sort of V in, meaning this is this is you know what you plug into your power supply, right? Right. Pretend this is like V A, and this is a ground or something like that. Okay. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. And you just put two resistors in series. Okay. And the output is the thing between the two resistors. Okay. All right. So what we can do is do a little s uh, simple circuit analysis on this. Okay. A way you can redraw this to be a more familiar version of it, but we're going to have to start getting used to this type of drawing, okay? But a way to redraw this is that you have some voltage input here, right? Pretend maybe if it's DC, then it's just a battery. If it's AC, it'll actually be a oscillating, okay? You can redraw it like this, okay? If that makes you feel more comfortable for the first few times, okay? And this point between the two resistor is V out. Okay. The reason I can do this is because, right, V in relative to ground, that voltage difference is V in, right? If it's, if this V in is 10, the difference between that and ground is 10, right? It's as if you have a 10 volt battery here, right? And this stuff is just going around, okay? Okay. Okay. And it's R1, R2. So let's do our circuit analysis on this little loop guy, okay? So we want, we want to figure out a relationship between V in and V out, okay? I want to write V out as a function of V in, let's say, right? What is that equal to, right? Okay. okay. So in order to figure out what V out is, right, I have to figure out how much should the voltage drop here? What is the drop here? Right. In order to figure out how much voltage drop, I need to figure out the current, right? So, so I'm going to have to figure out V1, right? Basically, the voltage drop across, right? Across resistor one is V1, right? That's going to be the current, right? I mean, I can call it I1, but I1 and I2 are the same, right? Because they're both going the same path, right? So I don't need to label that one and two. This I1, R1, right? Okay. I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. I know what this is, right? So I've, I need another equation, right? So how do I figure out what the current is, right? The, to figure out what the current is, right, it's basically going to be whatever V out, V in is, oops, right? But V in has to push through both resistors, right? Right. Instead of one, since these resistors are in series, it's R1 plus R2, right? That's what the current is. 
So now I plug it back into here, right? So V1 is actually going to be Vn R1 over R1 plus R2. But that's not the answer, right? That's the voltage drop from here to here, right? It's not the voltage V out, right? V out is equal to Vn minus V1. All right, going around in a circle, just, I think I'm kind of, it's a very simple circuit, but it's also very confusing at the same time, <laughs> right? I want to figure out what V out is, right? Right. I have some equation that tells me the voltage drop across this single resistor, right? So if this is 10 volts, right, and then V1 is 6 volts, right, it's going to go from 10, decrease by 6, and end up at 4, right? I was going to say 5, but then that wouldn't make any sense. I think it'll be the same number. Okay? So that's why, in order to figure out what V out is, I have to take whatever the highest voltage is and take away from that because that's going to drop across one resistor. Okay? So let's plug that in here. And let's see what happens. Vn minus Vn R over R1 over R2. R okay? So this turns out to be a, a nice algebra mess, right? 1 over R1 is R2, right? Like that. Factor the R, uh, Vn out. Vn out. Oof. That's a tongue twister. Okay. All right. Since these are fractions, I'm going to do go back to elementary school and then combine fractions, right? So common denominator between them is this. Oops. Minus. Right now they have a common denominator. I can add them, add the uh, numerators together. Right, R1 minus R1 is zero, so therefore this is actually Vn equals to R2 over R1 plus R2. Okay, that's actually what V out is. Okay, I'm just gonna zoom out and then rewrite this equation on, on somewhere. Okay. V out equals to whatever V in is times this factor R2 over R1 plus R2. Okay. Right. There's a there's a intuitive way to try to figure this out without doing a lot of calculations. Okay. You have some power here, right? You have some current going through here. Right, it's going to drop the voltage across. R1 is going to drop the voltage a little bit, and then R2 is going to drop the other part. Right? If you pretend this is ground, this is zero, right? Right? That's why this picture is even better. Okay? Right? Basically, what's holding this voltage up is R2. Bigger the R2, the higher it can hold the voltage. Right? Right? But you only get a little fraction of it. Right? So whatever this equation is has to be proportional to R2, right? And then inversely proportional to the other, the, the combined resistors, okay? So that's how I usually remember it, okay? It has to be proportional to R2, okay? But then you have to divide it by the combination of it because it wouldn't make any sense if VL is bigger than VN, right? Because you're dividing something, right? And you, and you divide something that's, you know, not, that's less than, in. Let's say you have you know 30 volts and you divide that voltage down, it always goes down. It's a smaller fraction all the time. Okay. So that's why this is a pretty uh, useful um, little circuit. So because let's say you have a 30 volt power supply, right? But you actually need 15 volts or 10 volts here and there, right? Instead of having a 30 volt, a 10, and a 20, and all you know having 10 different power supplies to supply all different voltage, you can just divide that just. You want to set the voltage on your breadboard to be the highest one you need, and you can divide uh, those out as you need it. Okay. Okay. By just picking the right R1 and R2, so you can set it to whatever numbers you want according to this equation. Okay. And that's basically what your laptop does a lot of time, right? So 
So your, the power supply in your laptop is actually 20 volts. Uh, at least mine is 20 volts, right? But I think like my RAM runs off 3.3 volts, right? So it has a voltage divider that divides, that brings 20 volts down to 3.3. But then my CPU runs at like 8 volts or something like that, right? So it has something that does that, right? My screen runs at 12, you know? All of these different voltages in your device, right? Instead of having to plug in, you know, oh, I need to plug in a power supply for my lap, for my CPU, one for my RAM. <laughs> You're gonna have like 20 wires coming out of your, out of your computer, right? So you, s you have one, right, and you can divide it up. Um, it does draw a little bit of power, right? Because, right, you're constantly running current through this. You're constantly losing energy, right, because of this, okay? It does have a cost, but, um, but it's better than plugging 20 different power supplies to your laptop, okay? Um, let's see. Yeah, before we wrap up, let's talk about load because I promised to talk about load, okay? So let's look at this little circuit here where it's 30 volts and I put a 10 kilo ohm um, resistor here, a 10 kilo ohm resistor here. What will be the output here? Anyone want to venture a guess without calculating? Or you can, okay, you can either guess or you can punch in a calculator, right? Whoever is faster, okay? Let's see if you can figure it out. If you have 30 here, 10 kilo ohm here, 10 kilo ohm here, we can either plug in the formula or you can maybe not guess a very highly educated guess. What would that be? 20? Hmm. Or maybe you need a, a better educated guess. You have 30 volt here, 10 kilo ohms here, 10 kilo ohms here. Okay. Let's do this. Since, since we need a better educated guess, let's just do it. Okay. 30 volts. R2 is 10, R1 plus R2 is also, is well, R1 is 10. Oops. And then R2 is also 10, right? This ratio is, is what here? It's what? One half. What's 30 times one half? 15 volts. So this is basically a one half voltage divider, right? Okay, you plug in 30 volts, it gives you 15. Great, right? So, and the idea is that this little output here should always give you 15 volts, right? That's what you made it to do. Let's see what happens, okay? Let's see, I plug that, you know, 15 volt things Let's say my CPU, you know, uses 15 volts, right? Right. I plug my supply and I give 15 volts to my CPU, right? And let's say, you know, you know, the CPU is a complicated thing, but like, let's say the equivalent load it has is 10 kilo ohms, also. Okay. Like, what is V out now? Do you guys think V out is still 15 volts? No, and that's the reason for this. Okay. All right. To figure out what V out is now, right, since we plug in an additional device into our circuit, okay, right, now we have basically two 10 kilo ohms resistors, right, even though one is actually a CPU, the other one's the resistor, right, is the equivalent to that, has an equivalent resistance impedance, okay, right. These are actually parallel to each other, right? I can redraw this circuit like this, right? You have a 30 volt battery, you got one resistor on top, you got two resistor on the bottom, right? It comes back like this, right? These two guys are parallel to each other, right? When you have two of the same resistor that are parallel to each other, it basically cuts their resistance by half, okay? And now V out, right? Remember this equation, right? Is V in, which is 30 volts. Let's just plug in numbers straight. If I can erase stuff, that'd be nice. Right? R2 is 5 kilo ohms. R1, ooh, instead of writing R1, I should write 10 kilo ohms. Plus 15 kilo ohms. Okay? Right? So 5 divided by 15 is what? 
one third, right? So instead of giving me my CPU 15 volts, you only give it 10. So you, that's why your computer didn't boot up. Okay? So, right, this load here, right, changes what your voltage divider is doing. Okay? So when you're designing a circuit, what you need to do is take into consideration what the load resistance is. Okay? Right? So this R load, okay, remember the, the, the 10 kilo ohm that, no, I'm pointing at the wrong thing. The 10 kilo ohm that my CPU load is, right, my computer processor is, right, this generalized as known as what's called input impedance, okay? Let's pretend this is my processor, right? So I have a big circuit board here that I'm going to plug my processor into, right? This is your, whatever current's coming out is being inputted into my processor so it can does this processor stuff, right? So the input, so this is known as the input impedance, okay? This is why it has the same units as the resistance, right? Resistance and impedance are like a little bit similar words in English, right? It's meant to be that way, okay? Okay, impedance is just a generalized version of resistance when we, when we have to deal with AC circuits, okay? Okay? Because impedance is actually a frequency dependent thing where resistance is not, okay? Okay? So how can we make this voltage divider less effective by the, by the load? Any idea? How should I have designed my little motherboard to plug in my CPU without having it drop from 15 volts to 10 volts whenever I plug my CPU in there? Okay, I'm gonna have the same voltage divider I'm sorry? Have it, have it loop back in. Ooh, that's gonna that's gonna be complicated. It might work, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna keep the voltage the same. I want 15 volts between here. Is there anything, any way I can change the voltage dividers? Is there instead of putting 10k and 10k here, right? What if I put in a different resistor? If I put in a small one, what will happen? Let's say I put a 1K here, okay? And the load is still the same, it's still 10K, right? What's gonna happen is that basically you're, you're, <laughs> you're gonna get one, you're gonna get like three volts out of here, okay? You can try this yourself, okay? What you actually want is you want basically really big resistors here, okay? Let's say I put one, well, let's put 10,000 here just to make the math work out, okay? If I put 10,000 here, I basically increase the resistance on the voltage divider and didn't touch the, the our, my, my CPU, right? All right? So let's see what happens when we do this, okay? So um, should I draw the equivalent? Let's just do it since so it's the first day. I think next week I'm going to stop converting these to, um, to this picture, right? So 100K, 10K. Can anyone um, tell me what the equivalent of this is? Just do that calculation real quick. 1 over 100 plus 1 over 10. And all invert. Anyone got an answer? Got it? No? 1 over 100 divided by 1 over, plus 1 over 10, all in reciprocal. How, what was it? Yeah, what's, what's the number? <laughs> 100 divided by 11? Okay. So it's 900, it's 90.9, right? So 91K. Right? So it's still not 15 volts, right? Exactly. Right? So if I did this voltage divider here, right? If I plug this into the my V out here, right? It's going to be 30 volts times 91, 
right? Divide it by 100 plus 91. So let's see what that is. 191, right? Ugh, fractions. I don't want fractions. I got 14.3 volts, okay? Right, it's still not 15, but at least it's not 10, right? Right. Maybe your processor can work with this, okay? So instead of 100K, so notice that by making these bigger and bigger, right, it has less of a less of effect by a load that is um, in this uh, um, high impedance, okay? So, so I'm just going to say this in general. So in general, what you want to do is that you want op you want things that has a low output impedance and a high input impedance, okay? So if I made my CPU to draw less current, but at a higher voltage, right? Instead of this, I, I can make this 100K instead. It will have less of an effect, okay? And in the homework, we'll get you guys get to play around with this number, okay? With just, you know, plugging in different values in here, okay? So that's the typical design for a circuit where you want, so this is the output impedance, um, let's see, out. And what's driving this processor is the input impedance, okay? So you want this to be um, as low as possible while you want this to be as high as possible. And that way when you plug in your processor to your motherboard, it's not gonna drop that voltage by a substantial amount, okay? It's never gonna stay exactly the same, right? Because if we didn't plug it in, we get exactly 15, right? Right, but if you don't plug something in, that's effectively having like infinite resistance there, right? Right. So high resistance gives you the 15, right? Low resistance gives you the lower voltage that you don't want. Okay. Um, and it's typically actually the ratio between this output impedance and input impedance that causes this drop. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm just gonna wrap up so we can go through all the stuff. So. Next week, you're also going to um, use this thing called a potentiometer. You actually probably, you can just take it out of your kit. Let me show you what they look like. So you open your kit, and they're basically these little blue things. The one in the picture here is the, the yellow thing, but it's these blue things here. Okay. Okay. So a potentiometer is basically like a variable resistor. Okay, I think the maximum value for these things is 10 kilo ohms. Okay, as you turn the knob, what it does is basically kind of changes what the middle output resistance is. Everyone find theirs? This way you will find yours? Yeah, you got yours. Everyone got theirs? Right, and this little, little uh, white knob up here, you can turn it. And that's physically really this knob right here. You're actually turning this little needle around. Okay. So inside here, there's a resistor, right? Depending on where this middle pin, you can see there's three pins here, right? This middle pin is connected to the resistor. It'll give you more or less resistance. Okay. So let's do that uh, real quick. And where are our, our little clips? So if you guys can grab, I'll just go around and give it to you. And you can keep this on your table. So take one and just pass it to the next person. Second, here, there's another one. I'm gonna grab one too. And then inside your kit, you should have a red clip and a black clip. Put the black clip on the black wire, red clip on the red wire. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. I should actually stop recording. This is just a demo anyway. <laughs> 